Hello everyone, it's Toby, and today we are drawing a lovely little village scene using a couple of fine liners, a couple of travel brushes by Da Vinci, and my normal set of watercolours. And we're just going to be focusing on how we can use these kind of minimal supplies to create a really fun sketch. The image itself, I believe, is from Stowe. I actually took it when my partner was driving me home back to Cheltenham. So I think this is a, a picture of Stowe on the Wold, but I'm not sure. Um, it's got one of those lovely Cotswoldy feels to it either way. Um, so it's one of these sort of middling, really pretty villages. And let's just see what we make of it. Let's see what we make of this scene. Now, with fine liners, I like to use a small and a medium. So I've got a 0 0.1, 0 0.3. You might not be aware, but the rotring ones, for me, they tend to be a little bit bolder. So if this was a uni pin, this might feel like a 0.2 and a 0.5 or a 0.6 even. And nothing wrong with that, just need to be aware when you're switching between brands of the kind of differences that you might encounter. And I'm going to start, as I said, with the smaller one. So this is 0.1. And the first step in any of my sketches is focusing on those shapes. And we've got this lovely new sketchbook. This is a sketchbook by Etcher, 100% cotton, really fun quality. Just got my, my little clips here at the edges to keep it down. And let's see how this Etcher sketchbook bears up to a really loose bit of sketching. I'm going to start in the distance today. And people often ask, where should you start? And there is no correct answer to this. So when Colin and I do our little lives together, which we, we've been doing increasingly, if you subscribe, you'll get lots of reminders about those. Um, but when we do our lives, we kind of chat about things like this. And Colin will inevitably start in a different place to where I would start. So it's really about learning what is comfortable for you. So I guess the next question is, and why have I decided it's more comfortable for me to start on the left here? Well, the reason for me is that this, I need to remember to keep really small. If this is small enough, everything else will fit. The other thing is this scene is all about that perspective, that flow. So what I do by starting down here, I'm just gradually flowing up the page. So I can kind of draw the silhouette of the scene all in one line. Not quite one line, I'm just taking my pen off, but that kind of feel. And I know that I'll get that flow of the scene coming forward. It might not be perfect, but as long as I get the flow, the feel of the scene, then it'll be, for me, for me, my style, good enough. It will fit what's going on. And look, I've run out of space for this far side house, but that's okay, because I don't care about that. For me, the scene is about this bit. So having started in this bit and run out of space over here, well, I can just pretend I always intended to frame it exactly this way. So that is another reason I've started in the bit I sort of care about, the the bit I wanted to make sure I fitted in, I did fit in because I started there. Now if I was using pencil, you might start somewhere else just and you can rub out and you can perfect your composition. But as a person who's got a limited attention span, I like to go straight in with my pen and I like to just learn to accept, you know, what happens, happens. So however much I mess up, I'm going to have to live with it. Um, and then you just come up with ways of basically learning to live with your errors. And one of those for me is starting in the interesting bit. That means I'll always keep my interesting bit in there. What I'm doing now is I'm working my way back along the scene. I'm working out how much of the bottom of the scene I really, really sort of need in. And I know I started off saying this is about shapes, didn't I? And I haven't mentioned shapes once. But all this time that I'm going along... I'm thinking of what's the top of this shape. Now, when I'm coming back, look, got a square, rectangle, square, square, finishing off this square, finishing off this square. So although I sorry, haven't mentioned squares because I was talking about other things, that's still exactly how I'm thinking and how I my brain just, it's how my brain works. And I think that's how the brains of most people, even those really fine artists, when they are, sketching their first bit of their scene before the hours and hours of oil paint they're still working out the shapes blocking in shapes with color that kind of thing so it's a really valuable skill i think to understand shapes um and so next i'm just finding the bits of greenery 
and I'm using these loose, loose lines uh, to sort of just show myself, the viewer, that this is something different. We've got these hard angular lines throughout. That's the buildings. Then these loose swirls, that's not the buildings. That is where the greenery is. And it will help me when I come to the colours to remember where to put my greenery. It will also help just unify things. So unifying things across the scene makes it easy for the viewer to understand, you know, everything swirly is a natural object. Now coming on to the other side, we've got this tree which almost comes down. It feels like it's coming down onto the road, isn't it? But that's just, obviously it's not, it's just the sort of funny perspective of the scene. I'm going to come onto the other side of my sketchbook as well. I always think this is quite a fun way to use a sketchbook. You incorporate the sketchbook into the scene. I did, I released a book a few months ago now, and um, all sold out, sorry, uh, but um, raised a lot of money for charity, which is great. But in that book, I talked about you know sketchbook art and using this line, just making it as part of the scene, rather than feeling constrained by it. Suddenly this line just shows what you're doing, shows a bit more about that process. For me, again, as a sketcher, as someone who likes loose stuff, just having a little, little bit of that process in is kind of really fun and just get a little bit of the road texture in, fill up this negative space a bit. And just like that, we are ready to move on. So that is step one. That is our shapes, our simplification. In this case, focusing on the silhouette, then finishing off the shapes underneath. Now I'm going to move on. Now these are some new brushes and I recently did a sort of first impressions of them. And this is actually my first sketch with them. So everything's new. It'll be really fun to see what happens. This is a Da Vinci Cassonier brush. It's a size two mop. And if you unscrew this, you'll be able to see it is of course a travel brush. Because I like doing most of my painting with travel brushes because I think it's great to have techniques, for me, techniques which work anywhere. So whether I'm sketching here today under a camera in, on, a, on a table, I don't change anything except where I am to, to sketch outside. Now with this big brush, this is size two mop, not a huge brush, but it's a big brush for an A5 bit of paper. What I'm hoping to be able to do is get a little bit of that drama straight away. So a few splashes of cobalt, a few splashes of indigo, then hopefully lots of water on that mop brush and just push it around. And I'll give you some more first impressions of this brush as I go as well. So what I am feeling, is you can probably see this is very flexible, very soft. Softer than actually I'm used to, even in some of my um, Chinese mop style brushes. Um, it's very soft, which is uh, a positive and a negative. So it's going to mean it's hard to use this brush for details. Even though if I try and just do a little blue line, it's going to be uh, take a lot of concentration to get a line even that thin, which isn't that thin a line, is it? It was a thin-ish line, not a very thin line. But the the pros of that means that it's great for creating these kind of lovely, soft, textured washes. And also, you can see it holds a lot of water. So this wash here has come out nice and smooth and I can fill the page with water without dunking back in and in. The reason I want to fill the page with water is so that I can connect my sky and connect down below onto the pavement. And this is, uh, I'm sure that lots of other people do it. Um, I've, for whatever reason, called this technique like a water bridge. So there's a bridge here which links the by water, it links the sky and the textures below it. So we're kind of linking the scene through shadows. I talk a lot about it in my my course on sketchloose.co.uk um, because it's a kind of a, a fundamental technique to how I enjoy sketching. And you don't have to enjoy it that way, but for me, being able to just link the scene together through really simple things which celebrate how watercolors move well, that's exactly what watercolours and sketching is all about. It's not about the scene, really. It's about getting a lovely scene, but based in the watercolours, based in how my watercolours move, not based in a perfect rendition of the scene. So just moving on with a bit of uh, green appetite, genuine, with a little bit of green gold in there as well. And this is where we're finding those little swirly lines, little swirly areas we had before. We can even do a little bit of a splash in a few places as well. There's a bit of extra texture in the sky. 
that I'm not that happy with. So I'm actually going to come in, whilst it's still wet, we should be able to soften things up. And being really gentle, I guess that's the advantage as well of this 100% cotton paper. You tend to have a little bit, it's a bit more absorbent, it holds water a bit longer, it's a bit more hard wearing. So you can actually come back and you can sort of scrub a little bit, just like that. I'm actually surprised this brush is managing it as well, with it being so soft. Wasn't sure it would manage to scrub in so much, but yeah, you can come back, you can scrub, you can move things around for a lot longer. Just want a bit of my colour to go onto this other page. And the reason this other page is fun is it, it gives you a chance to write something, gives you a chance to, you know, we could be, maybe I should, maybe I should be swatching out the colours I, I'm using. Um, so I've got my green appetite genuine here, that's the green gold, my cobalt, my indigo. They're the only colours we've used so far to create something which so far is very varied, very loose, but for me it's the, the exact way I enjoy painting, the, the kind of technique, the kind of looseness I'm after. Going to get a tiny bit more of this cobalt just dotting around. And is there anything else to add? I think we'll add a little bit more warmth. So I'm going to get some quinacridone sienna. Pop this up here as well. So that's my sort of warm colour. And that's going to replicate in a few places some of these sort of Cotswold, these stone fields. Maybe actually even better in a couple of the roofs as well, where the roofs are actually rather like a warm and lovely colour. Don't want it too much, I just want a few touches and we can always make more of it later. I actually didn't mean to put it in this house, this house is more white, so I'm going to replace it with a bit of yellow instead and use that yellow just in a couple of other places just so that we balance out the scene. And like that, that's step two done, the loose wash. Going to let this dry, we'll come back and see what we can add with a little bit more texture in the bold colours phase, step three. And there we are, so we're now on to our bold colours with a nice, mostly dry page. You can see there's a bit of water in the crack here, in the crevice. Well, we can always just pick that up with our brush. What I've moved on to now, I've moved on to my dagger brush, or my sword brush, or my angled brush, whatever you want to call it. Fundamentally, this is a brush which has an angle, has a, a point and a long flat edge. So, it means we can do really fine lines, we can do bold blocks, and we can do everything in between. So we can do trees and foliage in this kind of impressionistic style as well. So what I'm hoping is that in combination with the mop brush, this will be able to produce slightly more bold um, and specific areas of colour. Of course, in my little addition of the swatching here, I've got to add this yellow to what we've been using, but there we go. And now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to move around. We're going to find out some specific areas to add bolder colour to. So let's get actually a mix of that yellow, that chronicle in Sienna, and let's find a few bits to just highlight, really. And this is not a, a scene, if you hadn't worked it out already, this is not a scene which is being rendered in a sort of accuracy of colour. Now we're using the colours to represent the warmth of the walls, rather than to actually find the exact colours of the walls. Because really, today I'm trying to just have an explore, an experiment of the brush, the paper, my colours, and see how things work without sort of being nailed down to having to, you know, get the scene right, or having to sort of stress about being exact in any way. I'm going to use this little murky colour in a few places just to, again, try out different strokes, different aspects of this brush. One thing I'm noting with this brush is it is, again, it's very flexible. So I can actually get a, a very fine line with it, but it's uh, I'm having to concentrate. It's just not, not the same as using a, a round brush. Obviously, it's not a round brush. Um, and actually, this is what I've, I've struggled with in the past, is uh, not just being a bit too over eager with these kind of dagger brushes, these sword brushes and that over eagerness leading to me um, just not getting the best out of it, I think. So I'm trying here, trying here today. <laughs> you can be the judge of whether I'm doing a good job or not. And we'll just see, can we, using this brush, is this gonna be something I can add into my repertoire? Or is it just gonna be a special use brush, a special case brush? It's moving things around a bit. Now what we're missing for me is a bit of 
extra tone now in the front. So I'm going to drag some shadow underneath this tree. And then from there, maybe even a bit more cobalt, just to create something interesting on this road. A little suggestion of like reflected shadows. I don't know, something just, you don't have to be able to name exactly what you're doing. I just needed a little bit of extra something, more tone, more value in this road to make it more interesting for me. Going to also balance out some of these hot oranges from the Cronactone with a few bits over here. Perhaps a few little splashes over here might be a way of balancing things across as well. Before long though, I think this little experiment of a, of a layer of colour will come to an end, I think. I'll leave it there. Let this dry. They'll call this the end of step three, the end of the bold colours. And we're going to come back with a, our pen, add a bit more structure, find what these colours have done and act on that. So here we are. We are nice and dry. I've got my point 0.3 fine liner and we're going to, as I said, restructure. That is, refine some of those shapes. Now the first thing I'm going to do is come along our horizon again. That's where we started. And that is the key for me of this scene. Like I said, it's the flow of the scene. It's what takes us from this bit all the way up and shows us how we're disappearing down the street. Going to find not just the top of it, but also some of these lovely little swirls, which again, I think are key in kind of demonstrating where we are. We're not just on a, like a central London street or a busy street like that. No, we are down a little villagey feeling street, loads of greenery. Houses are a bit sort of ragtag and old, but also very pretty. And that's where having these loose lines, for me, also imparts that feeling, that feeling of character. Now I'm going to come back along. And what we missed out the first time is basically any sense of detail. So now we can come and we can find not just these little swirls, but we can also find the, the windows, just little marks to suggest those windows, the doors, again, swirls for the trees. And now we're onto like a wall, just a blank wall, isn't it? So we can either keep it blank or add a few little textures. We've got little uh, front facing bit of a house here, which I didn't get in the first time. Well, no time like the present, so we can add that in now. Just adding these suggestions of detail, making it a little more busy with our next layer of lines. Coming forwards, we've got this wall going off there and then our house along the edge here. We've already captured the top of it, but we just want to find, say, doorway, for example. Some of these windows, where we've added a bit of tone, we can just make a bit more real. This greenery is covering the corner of the house, but if we bring out the bottom of the house, we can get that sense of shape while still keeping this loose flowing sort of sense of greenery at the top here. This is a little wooden wall, so we'll give it those vertical lines to make sure it's more obvious it's wooden. Coming back over here we've got this wall up to a little tall bit and then just this pavement edge around to our lovely loose tree. Again just use those lines, looping flowing lines. This is a very stylistic thing, it's something I enjoy doing so you might want to do your trees in a different texture in a different way or more realistically. Come around the front just to get the flow of this street. Remember those little textural marks. For me, that just fills the space up a little bit more. And last but not least, we move on to step five, our final touches. And I'm going to start that with my pen. I'm going to bring in a couple of what I think of as key features in any kind of urban or rural meets urban scene. And that is these little wires. They just, again, they're like these textural marks. They fill up the scene. They tell you about the humanity going on, the sort of urbanism, but they also provide points of connection and points of flow through the scene. There's another one just gently back here, which we can connect as well. And that is it, done. Now I'm gonna pop my initials on and pop my signature hidden somewhere in there. And then just have one last look. Coming back with my angled brush, my dagger brush, anything else we can really just lift. 
Well, let's have a little go. Let's just have a little look. We don't want to do too much here, but maybe just a little bit of bright orange onto some of these chimneys is a nice little start. That's sort of something I enjoy doing. Little touches into the walls, into the into the roofs as well. We had a little bit of yellow going on here, but it's kind of been lost. So I think we can basically forget about that. But instead, maybe just lift a few areas with some green gold. Just do these little looping circles, little bits of bold brightness that injects a little bit of life without unbalancing the colors, which I think are working otherwise quite well. A few splashes, maybe, maybe that's what we're missing, isn't it? Just in the top, just a few splashes of blue which can, we can sort of reflect down the bottom as well. Touch that into a window or two to give that impression of a kind of reflection of the sky in the windows. Not something real, but something I like doing in my art. And there we are. So first first sketch with some new brushes in my new Etcher, my Etcher uh, sketchbook. Um, and I rather enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. If you enjoy this kind of style, then join me, sub, check out my courses, which are linked down below on sketchloose.co.uk. But most importantly, just sketch, have fun, create whatever your style, have a bit of fun with it and enjoy yourself. So thank you everyone for watching my little sketching videos. If you enjoy my content, please do subscribe to my channel because it makes me really, really happy. Thanks again.